Ever since the late 80s and early 90s, the internet has taken the world by storm. I've always been a fan of underdog stories, and that's where my next interview comes into play. Shannon Skeynes, aka The Hockey Guy, got his humble beginnings on YouTube back in around 2015. He started out as a guy who just wanted to talk to someone. He didn't get a lot of day-to-day -day social interaction, so he turned to the internet. Shannon Skeynes is a YouTube hockey commentator from Abbotsford, British Columbia. His story, I, I've always found it quite amazing. From starting out just doing his own vlog style because he didn't have that many people to interact with in his day-to-day -day life, has now turned into a hockey YouTube channel which has nearly 25,000 followers. I absolutely love Shannon's story because he pretty much just didn't expect anything to happen. He just went on and talked about things that was interesting to him, kind of like what I'm doing. But one day his channel just blew up. I guess that's what the magic is of the internet. You can be a relative nobody and then start making some videos, start doing some blog posts and then Wabam. You then have thousands of people following you each and every single day. I personally have followed Shannon for about two years now on his YouTube channel and it was pretty cool to finally meet the man that I get most of my hockey news from now. It's a very exciting time to be your own entrepreneur. You can start out with just pretty much a camera, not even really a good microphone, and then you can just start getting a decent following. I wanted to share Shannon's story because I just thought it was remarkable. Back in the day, you had to get hired by one of these big companies in order to kind of broadcast yourself to the world. And now today, you don't need to do that. And for this episode, I even wore my old hockey jersey since Shannon actually has like almost a hundred hockey jerseys. And here's my interview with Shannon Skeynes, AKA the hockey guy. You're listening to the Blocky Podcast. My name's Shannon. I'm better known online as the hockey guy. Uh, I just a middle-aged worker who decided to pick up a webcam one day because um, I wanted to chat and I needed somebody to chat with and over a period of about a year it went from being a personal blog to being uh, hockey related and then over the last year and a half that's just kind of blown up for me and it's become the, the main thing that I do so I've gone from being a full-time worker and, and doing this for fun to this is the full-time and now I have my part-time job to get out of the house and keep myself sane. I've I've always I've always been a big follower of hockey. Uh, when I was eight or nine, uh, hockey and baseball would have been roughly even. And then, you know, I kind of had to make my choice. And since hockey had a lot more uh, exposure, and it was usually on during the the winter months when you can't go out, um, and it's just raining all the time, uh, I would watch more hockey than I watched baseball. So it evolved from there. And I just found, you know, between the Oilers dynasty, which followed the Islanders dynasty, and then kind of morphed into what Pittsburgh was the almost dynasty after, I found all of those storylines interesting. And then, because I'm always cheering for underdogs, uh, it's sort of like when you, you come out of a movie and it's to be continued and you have to see what happens next. Now, um, you're more likely to come out of an Empire Strikes Back where it ended like everything sucks, wanting to see how everything gets fixed. And then coming out of Return of the Jedi and going, boy, I wonder what happened after that. So to me, when your when your team has a really bad ending, uh, you're you're more likely to want to see how it turns out the next season. And as a Canucks fan, I've seen a lot of bad endings. The, the funny thing with the Canucks is that the number one reason I picked the Canucks was as a little kid, the ugliness of this. I I, I loved it when I was a little kid. When I was eight nine years old, I thought it was awesome. The first hockey card I ever had was an Ivan Boldarev, and it was after he'd been traded from, I believe it was Detroit, and they used to paint OPG cards, so he had the Flying V painted on him, and it just looked ridiculous, but as a little kid, I thought it looked awesome. So I was drawn to the Canucks for that in the 1982 run. Um, Boston, it was a matter of, uh, right after the Cam Neely trade, uh, the uh, Glenn Wesley being the pick they got in the Barry Peterson trade as well. Uh, I always liked Dandy Moog. Moog went there shortly after... Uh, the Oilers dynasty got going. 
There were a lot of players I liked in Boston, and I needed a, an, an Eastern team. The fact that my dad's favorite team was Montreal, and my dad and I had a contentious relationship, made it easier for me to cheer for Boston since they were always playing against each other in the playoffs. And then when Boston won, I had you know reason to kind of gloat a little bit and call him at work. And there were nights where he would stay at work and sleep in his car rather than come home because you know I was waiting for him on the couch. Uh, and with Dallas, it's a case of it started with the Minnesota North Stars. These guys in 1981 was the first Stanley Cup final I had watched, which was Minnesota getting run over by the Islanders. The Islanders just ran over everybody in the finals. Uh, but uh, they had a player who was from Chilliwack, uh, Kevin Maxwell, and I met him and I got an autograph from him right after that Stanley Cup final. And as a little kid, you know, eight years old, I just thought this is so cool. And I had a, a pennant up in my wall, which was the Minnesota North Stars versus New York Islanders in the final, and it was signed by him. So that was pretty awesome, and it didn't it didn't survive till today. But just that stuck with me as a little kid, and that's why I cheer for those three teams. Twenty eleven Stanley Cup final was funny because I've always had a a, a a number number sixteen. I am is it sixteen? Yeah, it's it's six. You're sixteen wins away from seeing your two favorite teams against each other in the final, uh, and so. As Vancouver and Boston win games, I was always counting down. And it never got below, like, five. It never happened. And then, you know, the funny thing that started happening in 2011 was I noticed this number's getting sl getting uh, smaller and smaller. And Vancouver was playing against San Jose. And I knew Vancouver would beat San Jose. I knew that was a good matchup for San Jose, a poor matchup for the Sharks. I wasn't sure about Boston against Tampa. So for me, I was like, all right, it's probably going to be Vancouver and Tampa, which made me excited because I thought Vancouver was a really good matchup against Tampa. Tampa had a really deadly power play. Um, and then in Game 7, famously, no penalties were called, and it was scoreless for most of the game. And, of course, conspiracy theorists said that, you know, because Boston's, pe Boston's penalty killing was crap, that that's why there were no power plays for Tampa. I saw a clean game myself. Uh, Boston ended up winning. I, I danced all over the place because my two favorite teams were finally going to meet in the Stanley Cup. And then the final happened, and the first game was really boring. I really couldn't get into it. I was almost falling asleep in the third period. And then in the second game, there was hatred started showing up. And, and then game three, of course, you get into when Aaron Rome did what he did to Nathan Horton. And just then this huge hatred showed up. And I had, you know, obviously a lot of friends on Facebook who were Canadian. But through another website I'd ran, I had friends in the States too. So I had friends in the States telling me how dirty the Canucks were. And friends in Vancouver telling me how dirty Boston was. And as a fan of both teams, I knew they were both really bad for this. So by the end of the series, I was kind of embarrassed of both teams and 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 their behaviors. And then... When the riots happened, that was just the the cherry on the cake. It was one of one of the worst experiences I had as a sports fan. Because then for three months after, I couldn't wear my Boston gear out in public. Because then I looked like either I was jumping on a bandwagon or I had betrayed the Canucks. And it was the same jerseys I'd been wearing for a decade or two decades before that. So it was, it was rough. And so I, I never want to see them play each other again. I would be very upset if they played each other again in the finals because I know what happened all over again. I, th I think I think the obsession with getting more viewers causes them to make a lot of changes to the game, and I, I think it's important to get more viewers. I understand, but like for instance, them going into China this year seems weird to me because you're not going to put the NHL in China. Like I understand wanting to gain more fans, but if the NHL is not going to expand to China, which would be crazy, like you're going to put a team in Beijing and then. They're going to be an island out there, or I don't know what the end game is here. The games in Stockholm make more sense because we get a lot of players from Sweden, and it's great for Swedish fans to see their own players in games that matter. Uh, but Houston, to me, has the inside track because the Houston Rockets' new owner, uh, who also owns the building, which is key, um, wants the NHL in there. So the NHL's already put feelers out there. Um, and, of course, the, the big thing is, well, they want Seattle, too. Uh, one of them will get expansion, one of them will get relocation. I, I don't think there's going to be a lot of movement. I think that, you know, if if Batman was out and if somebody who was uh, more Canadian-leaning was in there, I think we'd see a team in Quebec. I think we'd at least see a discussion of Hamilton. But because of the way that the brain trust is now and the way that it seems to be really geared towards we have to sell it to the southern states... 
we're kind of stuck with it as is. And I, you know, I mean, I understand why fans are going in Carolina. I've talked to fans, and it's it's ticket ticket prices. They charge an exorbitant amount for tickets, and the team isn't very good. Like, they're starting to move their way up, but they weren't any good going into this season, and they haven't made the playoffs in about a decade. And if I had to pay $200 for a front row seat to watch a team that hasn't made the playoffs in a decade, I probably wouldn't go either. So uh, I, I think the the... the any, any idea that the, the NHL is going to become as big as the NBA, Major League Baseball, or NFL, I think that boat sailed for now. And they need to just make sure that they're not losing fans and that their rules are clear. Because I've had a lot of Vegas fans that have, have you know, because they're new to the league, saying, I don't, I don't understand. And then my answer sometimes is, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know either. I don't know how they're calling this either. Well, that was goalie interference. Why wasn't that? I don't, I don't know. Was that offside? I don't know what an offside is anymore. So the game, the obsession with expanding the game is fine, but until you get your rules straightened out and the game makes sense to people who watch it now, I find it weird. The The actual channel started out as personal vlogs in January of 2015, and it traces back probably almost a year before that with a different channel I had before that, which I discontinued. And then it was the playoffs of 20. Yeah, twenty sixteen. No, twenty fifteen. Playoffs of twenty fifteen. That I I did a I did a video at the start of the playoffs saying here's here's who I think is going to win. And I just I just went all right. Well, you know I I, I don't have anybody that I'm talking to. This, but it'd be kind of cool to have a video where I say here's who I think is going to win, so I can look back on it later and laugh at myself. And that started gaining views. Any video I did with my personal vlogs got maybe ten, maybe fifteen views, which is fine. And and then. These videos I was doing for playoffs, they got 50, and then they started getting up to around 60, 70, and I'm like, okay, these aren't my friends watching. These are people browsing in. So as the playoffs went along, I stopped doing the personal vlogs nearly as much, and I started just talking about hockey. And then once the uh, 20, 2015, no, 2016... Um, lottery the draft lottery when that came around and of course austin matthews famously won it and uh i wasn't happy with the result and i i i recorded my reaction to it and then i uploaded it thinking oh well this is just you know it's typical canucks they blow it so you know i wore my flying v just to because i knew they were probably going to blow it and then all of a sudden i look a few days later and that video had like three thousand views and i started showing guys at work i said what the hell's going on here they're like, people are watching you? I said, yeah, I know. I don't get it either. So, you know, once it hit about 4,000 views, I thought, all right, I've got something here. And then I noticed my subscriber count had gone from like 15, 20 family and friends to over 100. And then at the time that I met my now wife, Yvonne, I had just passed 1,000, which was early August of last year. And I just, I just dove headfirst into it. It was the first thing I would do every day after work, and I would talk about anything and everything. And then I started uh, shortening my videos. So at first I would do just like a 20, 25-minute video on anything hockey-related for the day. But that was just too much. So I shortened it down to 8-minute videos, 9-minute videos, 10, and built up the subscriber base from there so that by the time Christmas rolled around, I think it was at about 3,000. And then something got shared somewhere, and I've even gone to YouTube when I was at a creator day. I asked them, I said, "What I can't, you know, how can I tell?" And they said, "Well, something got shared somewhere because all of a sudden, last June, early July, all of a sudden, I had five thousand extra subscribers out of nowhere. So something happened somewhere, and I'm I'm here. My demographics are mostly early twenties, late teens, which I think is standard for YouTube." I think that's standard all the way across the platform. I've got some that are my age, but not very many. I know there's a lot of people that I know, and, and I, have, I have a lot of friends that are in their early 20s, late teens, and um, you know from my old job, and almost none of them have cable. Almost none of them watch cable TV. They're all like, oh, I, I haven't downloaded that yet. I haven't watched that yet. So when I tell them, oh, yeah, I watched the season of Letterkenny, they're like, oh, I haven't found a, I haven't found a stream for that. I have to find a BitTorrent for that. I have to find... So... The whole demographic, that demographic that's watching me is shifting away from broadcast TV and they're shifting towards the, the online equivalent or 
you know, in the case of YouTube, part of what I try to do, I try to make sure my video is uploaded before. Uh, one thing that I learned, one of the reasons that I, I quit my other job was that I found that if I uploaded a video before somebody else did, I was good. Like, Patrick Marlowe signs with the Leafs. So I had a video up immediately. And then, you know, Steve Dangles is one everybody compa compares me to. His, because, you know, he does all this, all this production and editing, his was up the next morning. So that night, I already had my reaction to the Marlowe deal and how I felt about it. And his was up the next day. So I, I garnered X amount of extra attention and probably extra subscribers because I upload right away. I do it as a stream of consciousness. I kind of think of what I do as the same as like Bob McCowan on Sportsnet. And I don't see him editing. It's just live. It's stream of consciousness. And that's kind of what I go for here. Well, Bob McCowan, I, I like him. I don't always agree with him. But I will say this. When he takes, when he takes an unpopular stance, he sticks to it. He doesn't change his mind, and I, I try to do that too. There have been times where I'll take a stance on something. Uh, you know, for instance, you know, a couple days ago, there's an Austin Matthews goal called back. Yeah, I agree with it being called back, and it wouldn't have mattered if it was a Canuck goal, a Bruins goal. I don't. I just I look at the play and go, "Yep, that's a fair play," or "Nope, that's that's stupid," and I don't care about the popularity side of it, and I'm not gonna change my opinion because there's a lot of people downvoting me or a lot of people saying you're crazy, you're stupid, look, you're wrong. This guy says you're wrong um, because I just, I go on my own views and on part of, and, and with, with having NHL center ice, I watch as much as I can. So I see a lot of action and I see a lot of crappy calls on almost every team in the league. So there's no one team that I think can take a high road right now. I think it's league wide that there's iffy calls that happen, especially to Philly. Philly's got really bad luck right now. Well, it, it's a random system. And YouTube even admits that if you go through their help section, they kind of admit, eh, it's kind of random. If you got hit, oh, well, we're trying to learn. Um, and I've, I've asked them and I've gone through their tech support. I noticed when I go through their tech support and I go through a series of emails with them that I won't have problems for a few days after. So to me, I think there's something they can do. And I even asked them, I never got an, excuse me, I never got an answer, but I said, can't you whitelist channels who repeatedly appeal and you guys see that their videos are okay? There should be a system where they can whitelist channels. So that, that would lower their queue, and then they can go after the channels that really deserve it. But because it's random, it can be your thumbnail. There have been times where I've changed a thumbnail, and magically it changes to green. It can be a keyword. It can be a word in the description. It can be a link in a description. And and I've had videos now lately, that's changed too, where I anything I change doesn't seem to make a difference. But right now I've got four on appeal, and I have no idea why they got flagged. There, And it could be something as simple as maybe because I have the word NHL in the description and as a tag, maybe they go, oh, this, this might be copyrighted material. But if I don't have NHL in the tag or the description, I, I can't attract new viewers because then it's just generic hockey related. And I've had people say, well, if you take NHL out, and, and they could be right, but then I'm losing any casuals that might come in. Same with the thumbnails. If I start just going with generic thumbnails, then I'm probably going to lose on gaining subscribers that way too. Like I went through, I went through VidMe, but VidMe I kind of got uh, discouraged with in that a uh, your your view base is going to be small, which is okay. It's not the end of the world. But b they have a, a storage limit, and I would reach that storage limit really really quickly with the way that I upload videos. And there have been people who've, who've reached that limit and then they delete videos and then they still show as being at or over the limit. And so to me, it feels like that's that's OK as a backup. But, you know, YouTube is still because it's Google and it's this massive conglomerate. That's the best way to, to make any money off of it. Um, you know, Patreon's been very good for me the last couple of months. I, I appreciate any of the help I've had on there. But uh, YouTube is still they're, they're the biggest dog in, in the fight. I know Daily Motion also is kind of out there, but I don't know. I, I I don't know that I would I would uh, experience a lot of growth through Daily Motion at all because I don't know anybody that uses it right now. Few that have gone to VidMe, I don't know anybody that said, "Oh, I'm going to Daily Motion," and then any of the other video hosters are either ones I haven't heard of or the ones that that seem obsolete to me. So yeah, I don't know. Um, it, but it, it, it is frustrating, but I, I try not to let it get to me too much. Cat.
but big cats love big cats um especially if i had to pick it'd probably be a leopard because you can domesticate them if you get them from when they're little and they purr like like your regular house cat but i would imagine it would be loud enough to thunder through the house and if i had one leopard it would probably get all the other cats to behave themselves that would probably work <laughs>